Dick Feynman always used to say he'd worked on quantum mechanics his whole life, and he always used to say, nobody understands quantum mechanics. And I, I talked to him about that at great, great length, okay? It's a shame he isn't still alive, because I think I now finally am beginning to understand quantum mechanics. And so one question is, like, where does the I come from in quantum mechanics? I think it's a, I think it's a confusion, actually. I think that one of the things that was sort of a wrong turn that was taken in studying space-time actually was what was done, not by Einstein, but by Minkowski in 1919, when he said, oh, space and time are really the same kind of thing. Let's package them together into this thing we call space-time. And he did that. Minkowski was a number theorist, a mathematician. And he said, it's very elegant. We can make these quadratic forms that are x squared for space and t squared for time, and it's x squared minus t squared. It's all very beautiful. We can package together space and time as being the single space-time thing. I think that was a mistake. I think space is a thing that's very different from time. Space is this extension of this hypergraph. Time is the inexorable progress of computation. It is an emergent fact that space and time sort of work together in the ways that give relativity. That's an emergent fact. That's not something that's built into the underlying model. In quantum mechanics, I think a similar wrong turn was taken. So in quantum mechanics, one of the things that one does when one formulates quantum mechanics in terms of wave functions in the Schrodinger equation or a whole variety of other, other versions of that formalism, what one's doing is one's saying there are these quantum amplitudes. There are these things that uh, we will be able to represent kind of the quantum world in terms of. And quantum amplitudes are complex numbers. They have a magnitude, the, 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 the overall you know, complex numbers can be represented in, in, you can sort of plot them in two dimensions and they have a, a distance from the origin and an angle from the origin. So the, the magnitude and the phase. In quantum mechanics, one packages together the magnitude and the phase. In our models, they come from completely different places. The magnitude comes from the counting of the number of paths in this multi-way system. The phase is basically the position in branchial space. There's a bunch of mathematics we have not yet worked out and that's quite difficult, I would say. But what seems to be the case is that what's happening is, in quantum mechanics, you are, you are well, I, I, okay, so I should say another thing. In space-time, one of the key things that happens is that the presence of energy momentum, or mass, deflects shortest paths. So, as you know very well, the, um, there are geodesic paths, shortest paths in space-time, and you know, when you just are dealing with everything on a plane, for example, the shortest path between two points is a straight line. If you distort that plane, the shortest path between two points won't be a straight line anymore. And the kind of original idea of general relativity was the structure of space-time is being distorted by the presence of mass, and that distortion is causing shortest paths to no longer be straight lines. Shortest paths are deflected, and that's the deflection associated with the force of gravity. And that was kind of, that's kind of the, the basic idea of general relativity. And so what happens in our models is, well, you can have shortest paths, same kind of deal. In this graph, you can just say, what's the shortest path on the graph going through edges of the graph? How do you get from this place to that place going through the smallest number of edges on the graph? So now you can say, well, the next question is, what's energy and momentum? This is something that really surprised me, actually. I thought it was going to be very difficult to understand what energy and momentum is. Turns out it's not. Turns out energy momentum is essentially just the amount, the density of activity in the network. So we've got all this network is being rewritten in all these different ways. We can represent that slightly more formally by a causal graph that says there are these little rewrite events. And every rewrite event can, is producing output that will be the input to subsequent rewrite events. And we can make this graph that represents the, the sort of causal connections between these things. And energy is simply, if we look at, well, we, we have to define in, in relativity, as you well know, we're talking about space-like hypersurfaces, these things. So, so events can be related in a time-like way in the sense that one event is uh, followed by another event in a sequence in time. But there are also events that can be space-like separated where those events can happen simultaneously in time. If you're time-like separated, you better not be space-like separated because one event is, follows from another event, and they couldn't be simultaneous. But 
there are events that are sort of orthogonal to the, the time-like directions, our space-like directions. There are many different choices of space-like directions. That's what's, what gives the reference frames and, and relativity and so on. But in any case, if you look at these space-like hypersurfaces, energy in our models is simply the flux of these causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. Momentum is flux through time-like hypersurfaces. Okay, so then you can derive the presence of the existence of gravity. And you can derive the fact that there is, when there is this density of activity in the network, it deflects shortest paths in the network. So that's a pretty neat thing that you can give an intuitive definition, uh, intuitive explanation of why gravity yeah. happens.